In this video, we will be finishing our chapter on chirality with a few miscellaneous topics. Although we focus on carbon, there are other atoms that can be chirality centers. So for example, silicon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Silicon is going to be very similar to carbon. It forms tetrahedral bonds, so if this is connected to four different groups, it is also a chirality center. Nitrogen and phosphorus are similar to each other because they're in the same column of the periodic table. And in these examples, there is a lone pair. So the lone pair counts as one of the different groups. So nitrogen, in this case, is connected to a methyl, an ethyl, an n-propyl group and a lone pair, so it's connected to four different groups. The same thing with phosphorus. So these are both chirality centers. However, nitrogen inverts very quickly. So a single enantiomer typically cannot be isolated because an enantiomer will convert into the other enantiomer. Phosphorus can also invert, but it does so much more slowly, and so chiral Phosphorus compounds can be isolated as a single enantiomer. Sulfur looks a little bit different because it can take on an expanded octet. So if there is a tricoordinate sulfur, it takes on a pyramidal shape. So here's an example of a chiral molecule where sulfur is the chirality center. And this is called S-omeprazole, which is also referred to as esomeprazole, as if this is just a prefix, um, and this is Prilosec, so the little purple pill for acid reflux, a very useful and widely prescribed medication. So other chirality centers exist, they have their own types of properties, and we're not going to worry about them, I just want you to be aware that they exist. Another topic that I wanted to mention is the resolution of enantiomers. Throughout the year of organic chemistry, we're going to see a number of reactions, many of which can create a chirality center. But if we're starting out with optically inactive starting materials, something achiral, for example, we will get optically inactive products. So it might be a racemic mixture. Well, resolution of enantiomers refers to the separation of racemic mixtures into pure enantiomers. Now, this is really difficult because enantiomers have the same properties. They have the same melting point and boiling point, so you can't separate them by distillation. They have the same chromatographic properties, so you can't separate them by chromatography. So there's got to be other ways to be able to separate enantiomers. Well, looking at tartaric acid, we have plus and minus tartaric acid enantiomers, and Pasteur found that the sodium ammonium salts of the two different enantiomers of tartaric acid actually formed mirror image crystals. So under a microscope, Pasteur separated these mirror image crystals and measured a positive rotation for one sample and a negative rotation for the other sample. So great, let's just use this approach to separate enantiomers. The problem is that, number one, this is awful. In some cases, trying to form crystals is hard enough, but once you have crystals, trying to separate them with a pair of tweezers under a microscope, that's not very fun lab work to do. But furthermore, it's really unusual for compounds to crystallize in this way. Usually, a pair of enantiomers are going to crystallize in the exact same way. You're not going to get mirror image isomers. So this was a really unusual thing that happened. Maybe this approach would work specifically for the salts of tartaric acid, but not for most other compounds. So how else can enantiomers be separated? Well, the resolution of enantiomers can be accomplished by changing enantiomers into diastereomers. So let's say, for example, we have an enantiomeric pair of carboxylic acids. Carboxylic acids react with alcohols to form esters. If we have a chiral alcohol and we're using only a single enantiomer, 
when the R acid reacts with the R alcohol, we form the RR ester. When the S acid reacts with the R alcohol, we get the SR ester. Well, RR compared to SR, this is a pair of diastereomers. Diastereomers do not have the exact same properties. Now, they're still both esters, so they're going to have similar properties, but these might be different enough that you could separate them by chromatography, for example. If your goal is to obtain, let's say, the R carboxylic acid, then you have to take your enantiomeric mixture, carry out a reaction, separate the two diastereomers so that you can isolate the RR, and then you have to carry out another reaction to convert it back to the acid that you were trying to obtain to begin with. So it's a multi-step process to be able to separate enantiomers. Another approach would be an enzymatic resolution. So we are taking advantage of enzymes that might react with a single enantiomer and not its mirror image. So let's say we have an R ester and an S ester. If we treat this with lipase, lipase is going to hydrolyze the ester to give an acid, to give a carboxylic acid. Well, the lipase is going to react with only one enantiomer. So in this case, the R ester is hydrolyzed to give the R acid. The S ester is unchanged. So now we have very different compounds because this one is still an ester, this one is a carboxylic acid, and so separation is going to be a lot easier. So resolution of enantiomers is possible, but it takes a lot of work and it also wastes half the product. So the last probably half a century has been really focused on developing new reaction methodologies that allow the preparation of a single enantiomer. And so what we're talking about would be the use of a chiral catalyst or some kind of chiral auxiliary that allows one enantiomer to be prepared in preference of the other. And the last topic I wanted to mention is prochirality. Remember when we talked about reactions that create a chirality center, I gave an example of this ketone reacting with a Grignard reagent where the methyl acts as a nucleophile and adds to this carbon. It creates a chirality center, but you're going to get a mixture of enantiomers. If the methyl adds from the back, that puts the OH in front, the methyl in the back. If the methyl adds from the front, then the methyl's in front and it pushes the oxygen to the back. So our starting material is a chiral, but we can think of our starting material as being prochiral because addition to one face or the other leads to chiral compounds. So we're talking about before chirality in a way. So if we consider the starting material, uh, looking at both faces. So the front face as we have it drawn, and then this one represents the back face. Now this carbon is connected to only three groups, so we cannot assign R or S configuration. But still, let's do the first step where we assign priorities. Oxygen would be priority one. This carbon is priority two because it's connected to three carbons. And then this carbon is priority three because it's connected to only one carbon and two hydrogens. Now, if we go one to two to three, we are going in the counterclockwise direction. So this is called the C face. Over here are priority one, two, three. As we go from one to two to three, we are moving in the clockwise direction. This is called the ray face. So this is a prochiral site. So we could talk about a reagent adding to the C face or adding to the ray face. So that's what happens when we have a trigonal planar site. We can have a ray face and a C face. 
what if we have a tetrahedral carbon that is connected to two of the same groups? This is not a chirality center. But if we imagine that we replace, let's say, the red hydrogen, instead of being hydrogen, let's make it deuterium. So this is H2 deuterium. And now if we were to assign priorities, we have priority one, two, three, and four. And so we would rotate one to two to three in the clockwise direction. So that would be R. So if this hydrogen was changed to a deuterium, then this would have the R configuration. So this hydrogen is called pro-R. The blue one, if we change this to deuterium, H2, we would still have the same priorities, one, two, three. We are still going clockwise, which is R, but our lowest priority is forward, so we flip assignment and this is S. So if we change the blue hydrogen to deuterium, then this would have the S configuration. And so we say that the blue hydrogen is a pro S. Why do we care about this? This becomes really important if we're looking at enzymatic reactions, for example, as we'll see on the next slide. Now this is an example I use in my advanced organic chemistry course and researchers are trying to determine information about the mechanism of a particular enzyme catalyzed reaction. And so we are looking at this particular site where we have two hydrogens and this ketone can act as a base, grab off a proton, we have the protonated ketone. And then the enzyme, so a base on the enzyme, can grab off a proton. But the question is, does it grab off the back proton or does it grab off the front proton? By obtaining information about that, you can learn more about the structure of the enzyme active site. By learning more about the structure of the enzyme active site, you can learn more about the selectivity of the substrates, and there's so much more that can be learned. So really what we're looking at then is trying to identify whether the front or the back hydrogen is abstracted. And so they carried out this enzyme reaction using two different compounds, either where the front hydrogen was replaced with a deuterium or where the back hydrogen was replaced with a deuterium. So in terms of priorities, this would be one, two, three, four. So this one is the R configuration, which means this hydrogen is the pro R. And then here we have one, two, three, four. Again, this gives us R, except that we have to flip the assignment. So this carbon has the S configuration, which means this one is the pro S. Now they're looking at kinetic isotope effects. So if the reaction is carried out on this compound, compared to if it's carried out on this compound, how does the rate of the reaction change? And here where the front hydrogen is replaced with the deuterium, there is a big kinetic isotope effect. Whereas when the back hydrogen is replaced with a deuterium, only a small effect is observed. What this tells us is that this is the bond that breaks leading to a large kinetic isotope effect. Therefore, it is the pro-R hydrogen that is abstracted by the enzyme. Now, I am not going to give you a question about this on an exam. You're not responsible for this. I just wanted to show you an application of the concepts that we're talking about. So this wraps up our chapter on chirality. We talked about how to identify chiral and achiral molecules. We talked about how to identify enantiomers, a pair of enantiomers compared to a pair of diastereomers, assigning RS configuration, using Fisher projections, 
as a shorthand that still represents stereochemistry and several other topics. Now, it's important to keep in mind that although we are done focusing on chirality, this is something that we will be looking at throughout the rest of the year of organic chemistry as we think about reactions.